Thank you very much. Um, sorry. In 2016, I, I, I wrote a book called Karl Marx, Greatness and Illusion. The reason for that subtitle is that I didn't, do not think that Marx's work is a stead, was a steady progress towards a triumphant conclusion, nor do I see it as the dramatic move from ideology to science. Instead, I see his career as a succession of attempts to conceptualize the advent and development of a novel social form, whether called commercial society, civil society, industry, bourgeois society, or the capitalist mode of production. Each of these attempts contained exceptional and lasting insights, but also gl glaring instances of short-sightedness. I shall concentrate in particular on three of these attempts. The first belongs to the 1840s. It was governed by a picture of original human downfall brought about by the institution of private property, but followed by class struggle culminating in an epic confrontation between bourgeois and proletarian. This struggle uh, to be expected in the coming revolution would end in the supersession of private property and the final restoration of human sociability. This vision was shattered by the disenchanting failure of 1848 revolutions. The second attempt belongs to the 1850s and involved a more precise engagement with political economy. It rejected Adam Smith's association of commercial society with man's innate tendency to truck, barter and exchange, and instead traced its origins to the destruction of primitive communities and the superimposition of what Marx called the value form, or capital, initially upon the development of exchange and eventually also production. There had thus been a transition from the simple exchange of useful objects, use values, to the ever enlarging and crisis prone circulation of commodities, exchange values, a global process which sucked in all pre capitalist societies. This process would end in self destruction and replacement by a higher social form. Around the end of the 1850s, this second attempt to depict the rise and imminent fall, fall of the value form, expounded in the Grundrisse, was disrupted, this time by the failure of any crisis to occur. There was no disruption of global politics, no destruction of the global market, and the expectation that the universal expansion of the value form would simply destroy pre-capitalist forms, whether in India or China, was disappointed. The third attempt accompanied the appearance of novel forms of radicalism in the mid-1860s. It found political expression in the development of the International Working Men's Association and theoretical articulation in the analysis put forward in Capital in 1867. Unlike the preceding Grundrisse in Capital, Marx held back from the depiction of the supposed rise and fall of an organism and implied a more modulated version, vision of the transition from the capitalist mode of production to a society of what he called associated producers. It too founded around the time of the Franco-Prussian War and the Paris, Paris Commune, but it bequeathed a language of social, de social democratic aspiration which inspired and shaped the conflicts of the following century. So I'm going to talk a little more detail of each of these three attempts. The first one I'm going to have to deal with rather summarily, um, just a few headlines really. Karl Marx's preoccupation with political economy began in 1844 when he had received an article by uh, Eng, Frederick Engels written uh, from Manchester uh, and inspired partly by the Owenite criticism of political economy which he found at that place. Um, he also drew upon Proudhon's uh, critique of private property. And what uh, fascinated Marx, I think, was the equation that he saw there between political economy on the one hand and private property on the, on the other. Political economy was the expression, he thought, of a world estranged by private property. And what that meant was that uh, change would happen not through political revolution, but what he called human revolution, by a class 
take, uh, existing outside uh, politics um, and um, uh, thus uh, this was his expectation through to 1867. Third point to make is that the proletariat was equ equated with the role given to labour or activity in Hegel's phenomenology of the spirit. Um, against the standard materialism of the time, which was naturalistic, uh, which saw man as uh, sensuous um, and the object of needs and impulses um, uh, and passive um, pursuit of, of, of pleasure and avoidance of pain, what the Hegelian picture gave instead was the idea, as Marx put it in 1844, that the creation of man was the result of man's own labour. Um, and from that uh, insight, he then moves, as it were, when he gets into political economy, to depict the forces of production as that which have gone forward in history, which is forces of production only being another name for human activity, if you like, uh, and drove history forward. The third point to make is, of course, that Marx's uh, insights come at this time and afterwards, I think, from the criticism of religion. He had originally been part of the Young Hegelian movement. He um, was influenced by the work of Strauss to start with, replacing Christ by humankind in the history of its, in its history. Then Feuerbach, the idea that man created God rather than God created man, um, and that this would be, and that this, um, and therefore that the real human species, species being of man, was the unity of I and thou. But this had been prevented by the onset of Christianity and other things, which related to human, human agency to the divine uh, or the state rather than to uh, each other. Um, and, the, and what this meant was that uh, the German working class, sorry, that the working class uh, had to be thought of as having a vocation. Looking at it from the point of view of France, what uh, the workers thought about was the ideals of the French Revolution of 1789, and in England what they thought about was 1688 uh, and Locke's idea of um, uh, inclusion uh, in, in political processes. Germany had no such past that it wanted to celebrate, at least, uh, and so the vocation is something which will come in the future. Um, however, uh, this vocation is precisely what was criticised by Stirner in 1846, uh, and um, arguing that uh, the working that humanity did not have a vocation, that was still to use the religious vocabulary of Christianity, uh, and therefore it had to be removed. Marx didn't really have an answer to this question, but he, he tried to turn the uh, normative statement into a descriptive statement and say that class struggle was simply a description of what reality was about. In 1848, however, when he tried to relate Marx's, uh, uh, when he tried to relate this idea of class struggle as having a vocation to the reality of what happened in France and so on, uh, this, doesn't, this did not work. And in uh, his pamphlet called The Class Struggle in France, he actually has to invent a quotation about overthrowing the bourgeoisie because it didn't actually historically exist. So that's uh, really the end of the first attempt, the disenchanting end, if you like, of the 1848 revolutions. However, we now go on to the second um, uh, attempt at critique. The second attempt uh, was to chronicle the ascent and approaching demise of bourgeois society uh, and, it closed, and, and was closely connected to the writing of the Grundrisse of 1857 and also uh, the hopes of the trade tr crisis of 1857. What Marx does in this picture is to uh, adopt the terms um, labour and capital rather than the class struggle idea that hadn't really worked in 1848. Um, uh, and what he wanted to argue was that the bourgeois economy or the value form, as he describes it in the Grundrisse, uh, it meant that capital was not like other modes of production, nor would its destruction uh, be like the victory of a republican or democratic movement over a particular form of political rule. The emergence of the value form, 
as described in the Grundrisse, was neither the result of conquest by an external force like slavery or feudalism, nor was it the result of domination by an extra human power, God or nature. Rather, it was the free creation of human beings themselves and had emerged within civil society. Capital was the product of free human activity in the form of exchange of goods. It could not therefore be understood like slavery or feudalism in terms of the crude polarities of class struggle. Its development into a system of production was a process that had taken place behind the backs of human beings, but was no less for that a result of human activity. To believe that the value formed like God possessed an existence independent of human activity was an objective illusion. What was required instead was a return to the analogy uh, with the mystifications of religion and the mystifications surrounding the economy. This was the theme he investigated in the Grundrisse and dis discussed again in Capital um, with the idea of the, in the idea of the fetishism of commodities. It is one of the most important and, I think, still living facets of Marx's achievements. As in his writings of the 1840s, the Grundrisse examined man's loss and recuperation of his so-called social or human being, concealed beneath the abstract form it had assumed in civil society. But unlike the writings of the 1840s, there was now an attempt to delineate a contradiction specific to the modern bourgeois economy. In the 1840s, the entity that had subjected man to competition and turned the worker into a commodity whose creation or destruction depended on changes in demand had been just private property. The tension between forces and relations of production had not been related to any specific economic system. Similarly, but, but in the 1850s, there's a different attempt. Settled in London now, Marx began to inquire how the bourgeois economy, or as he now called it, capital, or the value form, drove forward the forces of production. In the face of a worldwide boom and a return to prosperity, which Marx supposed had killed off the revolution in 1848 in Europe, he now placed his hopes in the cyclical character of the growth of productive forces, paying special attention to the volatile system of modern industry associated with the spread of steam power and, and the factory system. Such growth was associated with the recurrent bouts of overproduction, and this could bring about renewed unemployment, the uh, re-emergence of workers' movements, and the return of revolution. Marx now believed that he had developed a new way of demonstrating the exploitative char character of capital, the capitalist desire in purchasing labour power was to increase the value created by labour beyond what was necessary to sustain the subsistence of the labourer. This surplus value was extracted either by lengthening the working day or by increasing the productivity of the labourer during each hour of work. <coughs> the increasing use of machines made available an ever greater quantity of surplus labour, creating a reserve army of labour and increasing the chances of sinking into pauperism. More important, however, Marx now believed he discovered a fundamental flaw in modern capitalist development. Profit, he asserted, could only be derived from living labor. But with the advance of machinery, there was a proportionate fall in the number of laborers from whom surplus value could be extracted. And this would mean a decline in the rate of profit. Marx wrote, in every respect, this is the most important law of modern political economy. For what it proved, he thought, was that there was a mechanism inherent within capital, it, capital itself which was productive of crisis. Thus, the highest development of productive power would coincide with the depreciation of capital and the degradation of labor. And these regularly recurring cat catastrophes would lead to their repetition on a higher scale and finally to its violent overthrow. The centerpiece of Marx's new theory was the development of a social form which at certain point in human development had been superimposed progressively upon relations between and within societies. Assisted by the growth of monetary relations, simple exchange of useful products had given way to the exchange of commodities as embodiments of exchange value. Henceforth, history was concerned with the dual development of material production and what he called the value form, or process of valorization. Thus, commercial society was not 
as Adam Smith had thought, the simple expression of human nature, but the product of a social form which would be superseded at a higher stage. It was this global historical process, not only of exchange, but production of exchange values, which had transformed men from tribal beings into individuals and had created a self-sustaining cycle of production and circulation, leading to the dissolution of old forms of landed property and new concentrations of monetary wealth. Inspired by the use of Hegel's logic of circular processes or a spiral of concepts of increasing universality, Marx similarly presented the value form as a series of cycles or of one great spiral embracing more and more universal forms of human interaction. In this way, the circular trajectory of the commodity proceeded from the simplest beginnings through to its apogee in the world market. But like other organisms, not mechanisms, capital as a whole was characterized by a life cycle, which meant that its ultimate global conquest would at the same time mark the beginning of its dissolution. In the 1840s, the high hopes invested in the coming revolution had been dashed. The monarchies of, social, of Central Europe had survived, while radical or revolutionary bodies declined or were crushed. But for Marx, the disappoint, disappointment around the, 18, the end of the 1850s was all the greater. The hoped-for world economic crisis came and went in 1857-8 without producing any revival of revolutionary politics. Marx found himself virtually without allies and increasingly isolated. He was also slow to recognize the new forms of radicalism taken by the revival of English, Italian, German, and Austrian uh, radical politics from around the beginning of the 1860s. And Marx was also encountering at this time theoretical difficulties. The idea of the spiral encircling the world with increasing speed and intensity and resulting in organic self-destruction came to nothing. Even in more parochial terms, he was unable to connect production and circulation in an overall th theory, and therefore unable to develop, to, to demonstrate the existence of a process which might lead to the crisis and dissolution of the capitalist mode of production. At his lowest point, Marx in this period exhibited increasing signs of mental disorder, expressed in al alternating bouts of paranoia and megalomania. This is clear in his attitude towards the publication of the Critique of Political Economy in 1859. He attributed the failure of the book to a plot hatched by his publisher, Franz Duncker, and Ferdinand Lassalle, the man who'd actually made its publication possible. He avoided the more obvious explanation of failure, which would have been that the key chapter on capital, or the value form, was actually missing from the book. So publishing that chapter, um, which had already been in preparation with, throughout uh, the 1840s and 50s, would take another further uh, 15 years. It would take another eight years to complete in 1867. The third attempt, and I'm coming to the end of my talk, the third attempt to construct a viable theory was far more uh, successful. The years 1864 to 67 were among the most fulfilling in Marx's life. Not only were these years in which he wrote up Das Kapital, it was also a period in which he became engaged in the new politics of the 1860s, becoming an active and influential participant in the International Working Men's Association, which had been founded in London in 1864. Almost by chance, it had fallen to Marx, rather than the followers of Mazzini or Robert Owen, to compose the inaugural address of the association and formulate its rules. In writing the address, which gained the unanimous acceptance of the General Council of the Association, mostly British trade unionists, Marx made his greatest and most permanent contribution to the international. More clearly than anyone else, he had formulated the new social democratic language of the 1860s, both in the definition of the political and social aims of the association and in his global diagnosis of the condition of workers. In England, this was the period which culminated in the Second Reform Bill uh, Act, which was an act of constitutional transformation and mounting political excitement. The rule of Palmerston was coming to an end, and there was uh, going to be more turmoil. 
In the preface to Das Kapital, written in July 1867, same time this bill was going through, uh, Marx wrote about, quote, the actuality of the process of revolution, or what he called the Umweltzungprozess. Um, or, and although this is barely explored by subsequent commentators, his picture of the process of transition in capital from the capitalist mode of production to the world of associated producers closely mi mirrors his pronouncements in the inaugural address. Transition, in other words, was a multifaceted process. It combined social and economic development with political up upheaval generated by campaigns of popular agitation and described by contemporaries as well as himself as pressure from without. 20th century associations have, associated, have obscured this conception of revolutionary change. War and political upheaval in the tense and violent years after the Bolshevik Revolution of, 18, of 1917, which in one form or another lasted through to the 18, 1980s, created an almost indelible association between Marx and a Marxist language of revolution. Marxism was identified with the violent overthrow of capitalism and the leading role of a revolutionary party. Little was made of the politics of Das Kapital itself, with the exception of one or two apocalyptic passages imagining the day on which, quote, the knell of capitalist private property sounds and the expropriators are expropriated. The difficulty of relating 20th century visions of revolution to Marx's writings in the 1860s arises in large part because revolution in these writings was conceived not as an event, but as a process. Successful revolution meant the political ratification of changes which had already occurred or were occurring in civil society. The greater the extent of such changes, the greater the possibility of imagining a revolution which did not need to be violent, the conquest by English workers of peaceful means of political supremacy in order to establish, quote, a new organization of labor, to quote Marx. The picture of the transition from capitalism to socialism was analogous from, to that from feudalism to capitalism as depicted in Das Kapital. Just as Marx's text showed how critical changes in civil society from the dissolution of the monasteries to the expropriation of the actual agricultural population from the land preceded the bourgeois state of 1689 and the Industrial Revolution, so comparable changes in, 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 in uh, so comparable changes in contemporary England form part of a transition to a society of associated producers. One major instance of this process of transition had been the success of the 10, 10 Hours Campaign, a movement to restrict factory hours. Marx emphasized the importance of this victory for the political economy of the working class, as he calls it, by contrasting, quote, this modest magna carta of a legally limited working day with the, quote, pompous catalogue of the inalienable rights of man. Part of the reason why this vision of revolution as a process was largely forgotten is that Marx's most striking examples of transition in civil society belonged to the section on circulation in capital and was meant to appear in the second volume. In 1867, Marx wrote to Engels that his publisher wanted to see the second volume by the end of the autumn, and he thought that would be possible at least by next spring. And included within the projected second volume were meaningful examples of transitional forms. The new form of stock, stock company, the growth of cooperative factories, uh, were examples of how, quote, a new mode of production naturally grows out of an old one when the development of the material forces of production and the corresponding forms of social production had reached a certain stage. But the unpublished part of capital, as we all know, still in an unfinished state, only appeared two or three decades after Marx's death and was brought out in two uh, arbitrarily separated volumes by Engels in 1884 and 1894. Marx did not publish the subsequent volume because the theoretical problems he encountered when he attempted to bring production and circulation together proved impossible to solve. Had it been possible to publish the second volume in 1867, it might have been sufficient to maintain, as Marx had asserted in 1859, that, quote, 
Once the material productive forces of society begin to come into conflict with the existing relations of production, there would begin an, quote, era of social revolution. The mass campaigns and crowd pressures of the mid-60s could have been seen as the beginning of such an era. If Das Kapital became a landmark in 19th century thought, it was not because it had succeeded in identifying, quote, the laws of motion of capital. Marx had produced a definitive picture, neither of the beginning of the capitalist mode of production nor of its putative end. But what he was able to do was to connect a critical analysis of the current capitalist economy with its longer term historical roots. And in doing so, to inaugurate a debate about the central economic uh, and social landmarks in modern history, which has gone on ever since. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>